This is Melina Lee Williams Haas. I deeply appreciate you listening and taking the time to hang out with me. I will be addressing issues of life, the universe, and everything that are often bogged down and mired in shame and grief, and talk about how they can be repackaged to be useful and gorgeous and fucking awesome for you. So, sit back and relax, or, you know what? Sit up and freak out. However, you prefer to listen. Let's go. So I'm sure you're wondering where the fuck I have been. Oh, you're not. You probably don't care. I assume nobody cares. Although I have been told that people do care, actually. And so I'm back and I'm super excited. I don't know how long I'm going to be back. I have been assured by people who are not me that it doesn't mean I'm a bad person that I have not podcasted in several months. But a lot's been going on and I'll talk about that. But hi. Hello. I'm in San Diego with my awesome homie, Dana Pelabon. Hey, yo. What's up? I'm doing great. <laughs> And we're actually in this like crazy, beautiful rental home in San Diego. We came originally because we were to see our awesome homie Rami performing in their second time we've come to fucking Southern California to see them. This is the second time you've been here to see them. But unfortunately, unlike the last time, this time a little thing called COVID was happening. And guess who in the cast came down with COVID closing weekend? <laughs> So so now this trip became about us hanging out and eating snacks all weekend. And do not misunderstand me. That is a fucking dope ass reason to hang out. I mean, valid. Yeah. The play is the icing that didn't get put on the cake. But also... <laughs> Someone left our cake out in the rain, bitch. The cake's still pretty damn good. <laughs> and I'm doubly pissed because last month, my friend and I went to georgia oh that's right yes flew to georgia for the last show of the b-52s tour and that afternoon as she was flying in she messaged me and was like did you hear what happened to kate and i was like no she's like yeah the show's been canceled kate has strep and i was like are you fucking kidding me and so now i feel like perhaps i'm cursed well i'm gonna say yes Actually, <laughs> there's really no other explanation for this, <laughs> truly. Well, you, as someone who is cursed, I feel like you can, <laughs> I feel like you can speak on it. <laughs> I, I feel like there are so many things that are canceling that I want to go to. So this is just par for the course. It's so fucking uncool. It's so it uncool. It is uncool. I mean, I'm sad, and and thankfully, you know, for those of you wondering, Rami is fine. They are recovering, yes. didn't have serious symptoms. You know, it was like mild flu or a bad cold. So that part's good. And the upside, I did not have to see Shakespeare. No. <laughs> I love Rami so much that I fly to see Shakespeare. I know. Th- isn't that hilarious? I mean, and I, this is the second time I've flown to see Shakespeare yeah, because is. we went to see The Tempest. It is. It is. Which prepped me. <laughs> Look at that segue. <laughs> Wait, what did it prep you for? Now I'm waiting. I'm like, segue, continue. To see <clears throat> your show in Switzerland. Ah, that's right. Oh my God. See Yay. that full circle? <gasps> nice. Nice. So let us segue back to the opera in Switzerland. As someone who was an actor my whole life, literally, performing in an opera is not something that I ever thought I would do, aside from maybe, you know, as an extra somewhere wandering around in the back, as they sometimes do have in operas, they do hire actors to do non-speaking roles, but I certainly did not think that starring in an opera was something that I could ever do. And I had my fucking equipment with me in Switzerland and I unpacked it, set up my little studio. I was like, I'm just going to sit here. My first thing was, I'm going to, what I was going to do was a little 10 minute thing daily, just Ah. like a little sort of like a blot, like a little like, Hey, here's how rehearsals go, whatever. And then after the first week, what happened was (laughs) when we got to Switzerland, 
we arrived and we had a few days in another hotel because we were there early. We were doing some other just sort of like relaxing and hanging out shit. And then we went to move into the apartment that they had rented for us. Now, when we were in Switzerland in the spring to do a recording of a test track for the singers, because the singers need to hear something. And since this is a new opera, nothing exists of it previously, right? If you're singing Rigoletto, you can get any fucking edition. Yes. You can watch it. You can learn yes. the part. So we were in Switzerland, we were in Bern, and we asked to see the apartment. And the the folks at the opera house said, oh, we've gotten in contact with the, with the company that runs it. They say it's not available. They can't show it to us. But it's great. It's fine. Other people have stayed there. No problem. So this was, so we were basically going to be moving into a place we were living in for three months, sight unseen. And we get there, and the building is older than America. <laughs> well, it probably, okay. I mean, yeah. Because, you know. Yes. And- when we walked into the building, I immediately had the sense of claustrophobia because the walls, you can feel how thick the walls are. That's Do you know not, what I mean? That's not okay. Do you know what I mean? I, I, and so, and then the, the hallways are narrow and I'm five, six and I could jump up and touch the ceiling. And I was like, that's okay. We get to the staircase and the staircase is a series of half circles. No, nope. And they're just a little bit too tall. Well, and you don't have a, a history of tripping and falling on things. So it yeah. should have been just it's not fine. a problem. It's not, it's not, it's not a issue. thing. Like Georg looked at the stairs and looked at me and had this look of, uh, he like blanched. I, I could imagine abject fear. He she was can't. like, my wife is going to die. <laughs> You're going to kill my wife. Yes. So we, but, but I'm like, you know what? You're just on autopilot. So we take all six of our suitcases and drag them up the stairs. Oh. Now, our cab driver was uncharacteristically friendly and assisted us. Uncharacteristically, because in Europe, if you tip the cab drivers as you would tip in America, they're your best friend. Because normally in Europe, the, cat, the tip is just a roundup. Right. They don't get a percentage. So we get into the apartment and the staircase, the half circles, the series of half circles to get us to the third floor is between the kitchen and the rest of the apartment. So the kitchen is on one side of the floor and on then and then there's a door that locks like an apartment and you walk past the stairs to the other side where you then have the bedroom, which has just enough room to, for you to walk around the bed and a closet that's about three feet wide. So that is untenable. Then there's the kitchen, which is an efficiency. Yeah. I mean, in the other side, but it's still an efficiency, but it's okay. But it's by itself over there, right? right? It's freakish. And then the living room where if I opened all of my suitcases so that I had access to my stuff because there's no closet, it would take up the whole fucking living room. Yeah. No, you, you and all, I was just and I just started shaking three, and I was like, it's I a can't. three month move. I was like, you I have to have I space. I can't stay here. No, I I'm glad that you made a choice to do something different. So the whole thing started off Jai Ganesha that we were there a fucking week early, because if we had gotten there when we were supposed to the day before rehearsals. There is no way I would have had a fucking meltdown right now. I had a meltdown later, but. <laughs> It was to purpose and it was effective in its meltdowniness. But what happened was then we had to move to a hotel while we found a place to live in Bern, which is a city that is more expensive than Manhattan. It is one of the most expensive cities, you know, in the Western world. And we had zero amount of time to find a place. Oh, wow. Right. Because we're we're there and we. Right. Have to, and so so the next week I'm starting rehearsal on an opera of which I am the title character and I have to find a place for us to live. And while my beloved is a wonderful human being, he is also one of these people who is profoundly impacted by his surroundings. Yes. And so living in a city that held memories of a very fucked up part of his life already stressed him out. Then having to do all this moving stressed him out more. And then the promises and the work that we had done pre-opera to get him to the point where he understood that I was not going to be the same sub that I normally am to him. And while logically he understood that, I kept saying to him, I said, I don't think you understand the full repercussions of this. Because I had to get permission to tell him, like, just know about a lot of things. Right. You know, and, and... As ready as he thought he was, he wasn't super ready. So then that impacted. And we had just a series of, of just these 
not fights because we don't we rarely fight, but just big stress processing nights while I'm rehearsing for an opera and finding a place to live and finding a place to live. That's not stressful at all. So the fascinating aspect of this is that unlike any show I've done in my entire life, every single person in the cast, on the production crew, on the backstage crew, were delightful. That is lovely. Like, everyone was wonderful. There was exactly one asshole involved in the entire project. And you have to keep in mind also, there was a choir there were a, there were a significant amount of people in and about that production between <laughs> between the orchestra the choir there was a lot the crew the costumes the cr- we had i had a dresser oh i have make i had hair and makeup and a dresser like I, you all had wigs like it was <laughs> it was like a real thing for real <laughs> i'm so used to poverty stricken independent theater that like to do a real show See, I shouldn't say real because all of it's real. To do a well-funded show. As I say, to do a show that has the funding to yeah. be able to yes. actualize the things that we want to do. Correct, correct. In other spaces. Correct. You know, was amazing. And the only pushback we had was this one member of the orchestra who was an absolute D-bag and who had for the past year been j- literally campaigning against this opera because he hated it so much. Oh. And then he came into rehearsals because we didn't rehearse with the orchestra. The first three weeks we were, you know, first week was table work, singing work. Then we got on our feet and did the, you know, the thing. The director, Julia, was amazing. Like, at first I was I was like, oh, this is a show that's very sensitive about issues of race. But I had been broken in by another, like, perky white girl director <laughs> who had shown me that, like, no perky white girls. <laughs> Freaky white girls can do it. A woman, Marissa Wolf, who is currently the artistic director in Portland Center Stage. And um, she, this is very briefly, I think I might have mentioned this before, but in case you haven't heard my previous discussion about this, Marissa, I met while still living in San Francisco. She directed a show for Crowded Fire, then became the AD for Crowded Fire. And in the course of doing shows for Crowded Fire, her mother would come to see the shows that her daughter directed, because of course she did. And her mom was literally and you know what i'm talking about she's the audience member that you play to ah yes and the look of just joy and wonder and absorption and presence on her face would get you through any shitty performance you had nice and like the first time she came to see a show i was like harriet can you please just come to every fucking show (laughs) because like you know how when you go to see a movie theater and it's black people and like people like oh like there's presence and there's 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 life Yes. Like Harriet brings that. And so like we became friends and she saw a bunch of shows that I was in. And um, then she actually wrote the libretto for an opera about the My Lai Massacre that I took Georg to see. He fell in love with her libretto. He was like, she's got some skills. I would love to work with her. And so long story short, years later, like four or five years later, it's fucking happening. Wait a second. Harriet is from Crowded Fire? Harriet is, is Marissa's mom. Is Marissa's mom. Shut up. I didn't know that connection. Bro, yes. What? <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Dude, yeah. I didn't realize that. <laughs> Look at this that's her new mom. information. Yeah. She's terrific. And so and so it was like it really just felt like it was all in the family in a way. Absolutely. You know, and so working with her was amazing. Just watching her develop the script, not from scratch, because very much like my rewriting of the Anderson fairy tales, which I have done in my libretto, which is definitely going to be produced someday. Yes. She had been very distrustful of Prospero in The Tempest. She was like, this guy's basically just a colonizer and I don't trust him as a narrator. I just never trusted him. And so the idea of spinning the axis of the story to pivot from his perspective to the perspective of a character who's not even worth being on stage she's only mentioned right in in the tempest it was just so beautiful and so awesome so it's really great to work with her and and just watch the libretto grow and then to get it on stage and to get it on its feet and what was rather remarkable is that living in switzerland was terrible i despise their culture so much but melina you say switzerland chocolates the alps Edelweiss. N- yeah. There's literally only chocolate and Alps. Yeah, and their chocolate's generally bad. The Swiss chocolate that's good is the Swiss chocolate that's over there by the Italian place. 
Like the best chocolate I had was this chocolate called Torino. It's this company. Yes. And we went to the chocolate factory. It's so fucking good, but it's Italian. It's Italian Swiss, right? Because there's like French Swiss, Italian Swiss, German Swiss, Austrian Swiss, Swiss Swiss. That's a lot of. There's a lot of Swisses. There is. Because the Alps go through all these countries, man, right? So, but, so you've got that unifying Alpine culture, but across a bunch of different countries, all of whom have really wonderful flavor and texture to their cultures, except the Swiss. Their flavor and texture is money, 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 money. You're my dollar. I can't stop. <laughs> now it's in my head. So, like, for example, when we got to the house we rented, we finally found a rental house. I finally found a rental house. Super cute. Yes, it was very cute. Really cute. At first I was like, oh my God, it's a fucking studio. How are we going to live up under each other? But there was a huge yard and a huge patio. Yes. And Georg is a sort of person who likes to be outside. So he set up an office outside and he was out there most of the time. So it worked out all right. But we were told by the landlady, she's like, oh, make sure that when you go to the local market, you get the proper sticker for your trash. And I was like, trash sticker? And Gary was like, yeah. So in order to throw away your garbage, you have to have a specific type of trash bag. Okay. The trash bags are different depending on what canton you live in. So cantons are like boroughs. Okay. In Manhattan, right? And there's a bunch of them in Bern. And each canton has its own trash system. Oh, that's great. And so one trash system has blue bags, one has green bags, one has yellow bags, one has red bags. You have to buy these specific bags in order to throw out your trash. And you must buy a trash sticker. So you buy these stickers so that you can throw out your trash legally. They won't take the trash if it doesn't have the sticker on it. You have two hours, two times a week to throw out your trash. That's great. I would never be able to throw out my trash. Between seven and ten. Nope. Or seven and nine or whatever the fuck it is on Tuesdays and Saturdays or whatever the fuck it is. That's when you throw out your trash. And if you just, you're like, I missed it. I want to take it somewhere. Fuck you. There's nowhere. Unless you drive literally outside of town to the dump and then you have to pay again. Recycling. How many recycling bins do you think you need? Two, three, maybe? Paper, plastic. Yeah. Yeah. They have 12. 12. Yeah. Brown bottles green bottles oh. clear bottles plastic bottles okay the other kind rigid plastic soft plastic styrofoam batteries there's a specific recycling place for nespresso pods for example they have their own canister in the recycling zone oh wow and then there's some recycling spots that are just glass so if you if you have glass and aluminum and paper you might have to go to three different spots in your hood to throw your shit out welcome to switzerland it's fucking unbelievable. I mean, but it was very clean. I will say it was a very clean place. You know, but there are other countries that are very clean that are not dicks. And ultimately, my problem with Switzerland is they fucked up so bad in World War II and everyone just let well, that be a yeah. thing. Yeah, no. And there was no, they did nothing. They still have money. They still have the legacy of people whose money they took from, anyway, 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 fuck them. But- their arts culture is amazing. I can't say anything but glowing, wonderful things about the way I was treated as a performer by the Bern Opera and by all of their staff. They were That's lovely. fucking amazing. You know, like when I went in for my costume fitting the first time, they like took me on a tour of the costume shop. And, you know, they came to do the measurements and, and I, I, I have not had measurements of this thorough Maybe ever. <laughs> like your neck, the back of your neck, the front of your neck, right? Oh, like wow. how far is it from like your the, the base of your neck to your shoulder and then from your shoulder to your elbow and then around your upper arm and then around the bottom of your upper arm, you know. But the thing is that they need these measurements because they don't know what the costume is going to be. Right. And so once they get the design, they can build anything from those measurements, right? Which is truly miraculous like it's magic Tell it's me magic it. that they did the things and then we saw that red suit a fucking suit man which was which is fire <laughs> which exists and still is with you which oh is God. lovely yeah I, I haven't even put it away it's literally just like hanging on the outside of the closet door so that every time i pass by i'm like look at that shit look at what i fucking did it's pretty fly 
Look at what I fucking did. I actually also had a, I did a, a photo shoot with Substantia Jones for the Add a Positivity calendar. And I also was like, can you just hook me up with a couple shots of the suit too? So those will be forthcoming soon. I just want to get like a life-size poster of myself and hang it above the bed. With the suit? With the suit. Yes. <laughs> gorgeous red suit. It is a gorgeous Completely red suit. fitted to me and also a trench coat over it. Mm. And then they came through with like gloves during tech week. They're like, you also have gloves now. Yeah. And they were... They were like little half gloves. Yeah, yeah, driving So gloves. it was like special gloves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. And what was so amazing is that like when the costume designer showed me a swatch of the fabric, I was like, this is wool. I'm going to die. Yeah. You're going to put me in a suit jacket, a shirt, a suit jacket, a coat over it with my middle-aged sweating ass. I was like, I'm going to die. But what no one told me is that it's merino wool. Yeah, that's special wool. And I was like, that's some special ass wool. I was like, I don't have any merino wool. I don't buy wool because wool makes me itch. Well, merino wool does not make you itch because no. it is one of the finest wools. It is. And therefore the fibers are too long to itch you. To itch you? What is the active verb for that? What if something makes you itch? What is it doing? Itch. It itches. Yeah, but like if something's making you itch, what is it doing? It's, it itches it's you. It itches you. See that? I don't think, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. I think that's wrong. I think it's right. <laughs> So it did not itch me. So that's cool. And yeah. I think they substitute things like irritate. Oh, that's a good. Itch. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Yes, that's a good because one. Because saying it yeah. itches me feels it's, weird. Yeah, it's, it's wrong, irritates right? You. It, you would say irritate. It's Thank correct, you. but Thank it's, you. it's weird. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. It irritates. Wool generally irritates me. And these, this does not. It's just oh, it's so fucking beautiful. And it, like I was warm a couple times because, you know, I do get warm, but not in the way one would assume if one was wearing three layers of wool. Right. It was just really miraculous. And so, yeah, so we had myself in the cast and then four other singers and orchestra that was all strings and a choir that was, I think, 40 people, 38 people who moved around the whole set. They were sometimes under the audience. They were sometimes Ridiculous. above us performing in a, on a catwalk in the back of the, of the theater. It was just so ethereal and so beautiful. And I know you're asking, can I see it? Can I see it? Can I hear it? Well, I don't think so. There does exist a recording, but the legality of how it can be released is still very sketchy. What I implore you to do is to <laughs> write to your local opera house and say, there's a new opera. Yes. That features, you know, two brown skinned main characters. Yes. It's a contemporary opera. It's doing real good in the European world. Read the reviews, find it, bring it to your local opera house. Like that grassroots movement would be helpful. People always like, how can I see it? When is it coming? I'm like, you need to make the demand for it. This is the thing with contemporary work. The demand needs to be there. So start a letter writing campaign to your local opera house. Say, you know what? We need to have Harriet Chessman and Georg Friedrich Haas's Sycorax in our opera house. That would actually be pretty amazing to right? be able to have people really engage with the arts organization yes. to say, here are the things that yep. we are passionate about. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that does make a difference because opera right now is in the process of atrophying and slowly dying. And they have these annual conferences where they lament and try to figure out like, oh, what are you doing? I'm like, well, you know what? Stop doing the same shit. Right. Or if you are going to do the same shit, don't just think you can set it on the moon and have it be relevant. Yes. Right? So, yeah. Do and all I, that. Think, I think all aspects of what it is that we're seeing on stage is having that, yeah. having that moment yeah. where people are saying we're not seeing this stuff anymore mm -hmm. they want to see another revival of something else that has been revived 700 times no which is one of the things that i appreciated about sycorax is that it is a it is a new story yeah even though it is based on this can, cannot is it canonic, canonical canonical yeah, yeah. Cannot, oh look at that word work it is it is new it is different and still incorporates things that that are about the here and now. Yes. Here's the thing, like there's so much pushback against theater that specifies the race of the characters when it specifies the race of a character as a brown person. Correct. There's all of this like, oh, isn't that also racist? And it's like, well, no. And the fact that you even have to be 
told why what you said is a steaming pile of bullshit. Right. Makes me sad for the future of the industry in which you are working. Yes. And the pushback is real and the pushback is terrible. And I don't want to get into all of it right now, but just know that insisting that an opera have two black leads is gets people bristling often. They're like, well, we have, you know, we just did this opera and the lead was from Japan. I'm like, great, that's fine. That's great. But the thing is that you taking an old opera and mixing it up by having a non-white person in a role has nothing to do with an opera that is to purpose characters that are of this racial background. Right. It's a completely different thing. It brings different energy to the stage. It brings different meaning to the words. To have a black mother reunited with her black son who was separated from her by deception and evil by a white man, that resonates very differently than like a mother and son right. reunited. Right. Like, you know, it hits different. It lands different. It does. Because we have different stories in our bodies. That is correct. And this is what makes me crazy. I'm like, my body has a different story than the body of a white person. My DNA is different than yours. And this is why these types of shows are needed. Yeah. Because it brings in the perspective that has been historically excluded. Mm -hmm. And and that's got to end. Especially if the, the arts world is going to progress. And if it is going to gain new audiences. Because we want to see ourselves. It is not good enough yeah. to replace ourselves into someone else's narrative. Exactly. Exactly. And this is, I mean, this is why we just saw the fucking Woman King last night. And I'm still... I don't even know what happened, but the thing happened. But this is the thing, right? Like, I can watch A Little Mermaid with a Black Little Mermaid, and that's great. Right. Yeah? Yeah. You know, I can watch, I don't know, whatever. Like, well, this is new Lord of the Rings series where they threw a sister in there and everyone freaked out. Oh, it was the <laughs> House of the Dragons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> where they're all, there's like a whole bunch of black folks in the House of the Dragons. Do they have their testicles, though? They do. Okay, good, good, good. And they have blonde dreadlocks. I saw some photos of that and I was like, oh, you're so feeling that. Yeah. Looks great. Yes. It looks so awesome. But like, and that's fantastic. However, there's also the necessity to see, as movies do, share history. And, right. And reality and blend reality with fantasy and all these things. And so to see that reflected on screen I think that white people don't understand why it's so important for us because when something is just a part of your life, it's like trying to explain to someone why, why, I don't even know what it's like. Why, it's trying to explain to someone why comfortable shoes are important. Right? Well, like, I mean, when you've never experienced, everything is coded very specifically to engage one portion of the population. Yeah. And so it is hard to step out of that. But for us, Nothing is coded. Therefore, <laughs> we have no code. We've had to be able to fight for every yeah. every portion of that thing. So that that representation is <sighs> is paramount, and it is important that yeah. that it is specified. This is what this is because this is a perspective that is different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is this is my hope is that more operas like this and you know fire all up in my bones and. There was another opera that was recently produced. Solange just wrote something for the opera, didn't she? Did she? Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah, she I think, did. Yeah, yeah. It was at the um, Met, I think. These things are super critical. And it just, it made me so tired that everyone was sort of like waving their hands in the air like they just didn't care that the Met did this. I was like, fuck you. Right. How many hundreds of, hundred and third, how, what? Over a century. And now you're getting to it? I don't even, fuck, fuck you. Right. <laughs> I'm like, I couldn't even be happy. I saw it. I support it. Very nice. Thank you. But also, like, look at who it was. These are people who, like, the people who are doing it were the top of the tippity top with the most, like, it, it's, we're not organically part of the process. Yes. We would not be allowed to fail, for example. That is stumble correct. stumble and figure our shit out and land. Like, you had to stick that landing on jump. There was no, like, do you know what I mean? And so it was just so frustrating. Beautiful, but frustrating which is part of the reason why I'm just so glad that it's just becoming more and more. Like, the fact we were talking about that The Woman King was written by white people, right? Like, oh, shouldn't it be written by black people? I'm like, well, sure. But also, it just should be written. Right. 
And if those are the people who have the skill to tell that story, which I feel they did, I feel like that story was very well told. And I'm just so appreciative of the fact that I got to watch a movie where I think there was one secondary character who was white. Yes. And that was it. Yeah. <laughs> that is helpful. You know, it's like, it was part of the reason why I absolutely adored. I might even, I mean, I, I know that a lot of people are like, oh, a little disappointed in, you know, Black Panther 2, Electric Boogaloo. But I'm like, you know what? No. Because this was a movie where I did not have to look at a white person for most of the movie. Most of the movie. Yes. There was no white character who could not have been cut yep. without absolutely not damaging the narrative. Yes. Right? When was the last time you saw a fucking movie like that? Well, they're not generally made. Yeah. Or, the, I mean, if they are made, they are independent films that are not getting the money exactly. for the distribution and exactly. the marketing that is needed. Exactly. Yes. You know, or the movies pivot on whiteness, right? Yes. So Get Out pivots on whiteness, right? Right. It's an amazing black film. And it could not, that story could not be told without whites. Yes. And so this to me, like, for example, all of the, all the slavery porn that we've been getting for the past 20 years pivots on whiteness. It's essentially how we have triumphed over oppression. But that's one of the reasons, like, Moonlight was one that did not pivot oh, on God. whiteness. That movie broke my heart in 18 times. 700 like seven, pieces. Ugh. But also so small, small film. Yeah. What was the other one? Moonlight and... Um... If Beale Street could talk. I didn't. I refuse to see that one. No, 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 dude, 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 nope. dude, 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 dude. I'm gonna cry. Moonlight. You need was... to see what's her face. Which one her face? Oh God, the actress. What's her name? Okay, so this is the point where if you have not seen Woman King, I'm gonna have my awesome producer Cody do a little thing, and then we'll be like fast forward to this point in the podcast, and then we'll be past that point. Right. Yes. Although if you have made it to this part of the podcast and have not seen Woman King, you should probably just press it. pause and go, go see, see the movie or stream it. You can stream it. Yeah, you can just watch it because I, I'm not going to like you if you haven't seen <laughs> like I just don't like you and you're probably racist. Well, yes. Hey, super awesome producer here. If you want to skip the part about the Woman King, go ahead and skip to 40 minutes and 27 seconds. Glad to have you back, Mo. So Woman King, uh, based on real human beings that really kicked ass back in the day. And of course, Sister Viola is yeah. just fucking riveting every goddamn second the camera's on her. She is. She is. She absorbs the screen. Just her presence absorbs the so screen. Fucking, the one thing I will say is I could have I could have used some help with the dialect. The dialect was rough. It was. I would say it was Bane level difficult to understand them. Well, not quite. A, I mean, yeah. like there were many parts of the movie for Bane where I didn't know anything that that man was saying. I was just like, well, I'm assuming it's bad guy stuff. <laughs> Because that was like 25% of the time I was, like, I was missing a quarter of things. Like, there would be a sentence, and I would be like, I heard that word. But they were speaking very, and it was beautiful. It flowed. It was lovely. It was consistent. It was all of those things. Yes. And it was tough to track. It was tough for me to track it at certain points. So that was the one thing where I was like, I was struggling a little bit. Now, I did not miss anything critical. No. And I feel like it's the sort of story where, you would probably catch most of it, even if there was, I'm thinking about it and I'm like, even if there was like no dialogue, like imagine right. it just being a silent movie, you would get like 80% of what the fuck was going on. A hundred percent. The visuals were. Because it's very, it's a. Such yes. A, yeah. It is a visual playland of what it is that is being talked through in the story. Yeah. 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 The whole development of the young women as they come in and train. All of this, you know. And my girlfriend, Aoki. Oh, God. I know. You love those eyebrows. <laughs> you love those eyebrows. It was the eyebrows. <laughs> and the intense amount of amazing kickassery. Oh, God. So the, the, the story, well, if you're listening to this, you've already seen it, right? So this is the spoiler part. Yes. The thing that I did not 
see coming, obviously, which is the big twist, which is, you know, that, that, that the woman king has a little baby king. <laughs> <laughs> Who is revealed during the course of the of the film? And I was like, I was like, we are always innovating. Look at this. This bitch chipped her own baby. Yep. Yep. <laughs> she microchipped her kid. <laughs> she wanted to know. And then found her again. I was like, bitch, yes, thank you. We are always innovating. Yes. And so what was re- so remarkable to me was how emotionally true that sequence was. Because like I feel like so many films would just have them run into each other's arms. And they didn't. And, they and that's didn't. what I, because the, the emotions are so complex huh. and, oof. It's so much. It's so much. I should go back and like at some point let people know, like to give a trigger warning for this movie. If you have a trigger, you will be triggered. Yes. I feel like if there's, if, if of the top 10 things that trigger people, all of it is there. Yes. A hundred percent. Like anything that has to do with family shit, boom. Anything that has to do with, you know, essay, boom. Anything that has to do with family shit. <laughs> if you are a vet and you are a survivor of, of battle, boom. Like that shit is there. If you don't like cutting, this oh, is God. not the show for you. Let me tell you, if you are like me and, and I don't know, there's probably a medical term for this. But I have shadow pain when I see certain types of pain inflicted in movies Mm -hmm. or on television. And it's very much like in the same way that people talk about ghost limb pain. Mm -hmm. It is exactly that. Yeah. I the first time I saw this movie, I almost died on the hamstring part. (laughs) I'm pretty sure that Uh, even just saying it now, I feel I feel my tendon switching. It was not okay. Yeah, that one was rough, but it was fast. Unlike the thorn sequence, which was not fast. Yeah. That was not fast. And my feet started burning and the backs of my legs started, like I could feel the blood running down my legs. See, when I saw that, I just kept thinking, well, I guess I wouldn't be in a goji because no. (laughs) I'd be like, oh, you want me to go through those things? Yeah, no, we're going to not do that. (sighs) Fucking fierce bitches. They are. It was it was so it was just so wonderful how you saw the relationships develop and the way they handled the relationship between her and the king and the way they handled even the relationships the sort of the the court yes intrigues yes you know all of that was just so delicately handled well it was a well-written film yeah and and when you take a a historical group of people right and look at their customs i mean you can really flush out i think a a well-rounded if you take the time and the energy yeah well-rounded well-researched well-researched yeah and was... it's not like they didn't take liberties there are definitely yeah. liberties yeah. but i i thought i feel like the liberties are in this were in the spirit of the story and not exaggerations do you know what i mean yes like 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 extrapolations from stuff i never have a problem with historically it's when i feel like they just say okay you know what we're just going to slap this thing on here and it's fine it's like no 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 like did they actually have a situation where they were like liberating people from the thing and i don't know if that detail occurred but i don't really care no i think for the story that was served it was right for the spirit of the story exactly and so that was really wonderful and just so amazing. And it was very heavy for me as well, just like as a as someone who does not have kids and did want to have kids and goes through that occasional cycle of hormonal mourning that I cannot control and no one warns you about. Right. Where you're just like sitting there and like you see a baby and burst into tears. Yes. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? What fresh hell is this? Son of a bitch. And so that aspect of the movie, like, it started kicking my ass at that point where I was just like, whew, oof. Because there were many points in my life where, like, the couple of pregnancy scares I did have, that baby would have been in in the system. Right. Because I was just not equipped. Like, when I was 17 and I, you know, was like, well, first of all, I was just terminated. (laughs) But you know what I'm saying. And so that was really profound for me. And then 
trying to figure out a mother-daughter dynamic after that type of rift. You know, I obviously didn't have that type of rift, but I had an emotional gulf. Yes. That talk that speaks to the reality of that, that can feel like that, you know. And this is the thing that good storytelling does, is that even if the situation is not a precise match to yours, there can be an emotional arc parallel. And I think that they did that so, so beautifully with their relationship. I agree. And then I'm going to, I'm going to roll a little bit back over to Sycorax mm -hmm. and, and ask, how then were you able to play that mother, knowing that there is some of that, that is unexpected and kind of inherent in, in some mm. of these situations. Yeah, it was, I'm gonna, now I'm going to cry. It was incredibly fucking hard. And you know, there's a point when you're building the character right. and you're looking at it and then you get in it and then you're like, oh, fuck. And it really was not until we were, because there's so much technically going on, until we were in tech and we were doing the, we were moving the blocking onto the set and we had to make all sorts of adjustments because now we had 30 tubes <laughs> everywhere right, right and trying to figure that out and there was one point where we were trying to figure out at the the, the the moment where we do reunite and we were trying to figure out if i was going to bridge the gap and go into his prison or draw him out of it and we had a whole like series of discussions about which felt better physically and i'll tell you this is really funny the first week we were rehearsing anytime he and i had to do that scene he would start laughing oh he would start laughing and i was like what is going on am i am i is it me because I immediately like think I'm like, oh, my God, I'm making a goofy face. I'm trying to act and I'm and I'm looking stupid. And that's why he's laughing. But it wasn't. It was, no, it was nerves. It was like he poor kid is South African living in London and had visa problems. So he missed the first week of rehearsal. Oh, no. And so he had to come in, hit the ground running. This was his first contemporary opera. Oh, wow. And so it was, the poor thing was just stressed. But he is like a fucking, this dude is going to be yet another actor, performer I've worked with who shoots to superstardom. Much like my fucking, <laughs> my friend from the last Christina Anderson play who's now playing like Black Manta. <laughs> Black Manta? Yeah. Is that David? No, not David Diggs, who I also know who shot to stardom. But I didn't, I never ever performed with David. So we're going to take a break to talk through this person who shot to stardom in my brain from the Watchmen. Oh, right. <sighs> I'm yeah. in love with him. Yeah, he's a brilliant fucking actor. He is a brilliant actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything I've seen him in since. He's and, just uh, been. Who else was someone that I knew who shot to stardom? Well, Jesse Martin. Yeah, I mean, he's great. You know, another one. I went to school with him at NYU. And no, then they he's were a like, oh, he's doing a show over on Second Avenue. He's doing this show called Rent. And I was like, oh, great. Good for him. <laughs> right? Yeah, I don't even, I don't like him yet. Oh, my God. He's coming out right now. And, and just, I just, I don't. I saw it and I was like, Ugh. So, like, first, Castle. pay your rent. And then I felt really bad saying that because I don't believe people should, I mean, housing's a human right. But I really wanted them in particular to pay their rent just because they're so freaking annoying. <laughs> I'd never seen a show where I just did not feel like I gave a fuck about anybody. And then she started mooing at me and I was like, don't, don't moo. Like, I don't, I don't understand what's no, happening here. That was one of those things. I mean, like rent cats, phantom, they don't do anything for me. No, nothing. Cats, nothing cats made me very sad. Did I tell you, I actually, I was telling you earlier about when I was working at the Cerritos Center for the Performing Arts, we had a week of cats. And after the second, sh and mind you, I never watched it on Broadway. Of course, the soundtrack was played everywhere, so I was familiar with it. But I had to go through eight performances of cats. And I literally, I was poor and I took two shifts off because I could not stand it. I... I grew up watching the commercial yes, about cats. Yes, Jesus, that fucking commercial. And then Barbara Streisand singing the song. So that's literally the only two things <laughs> I ever knew about this show. So the first touring Broadway show I saw as an adult where I could buy my ticket and go to a show was Cats. And I was so excited because I have this commercial from my head from the 80s. Yes. And Barbara Streisand. And then that piece of crap started playing on stage and i was like what is happening what is happening 
why it was I'm so sorry there was no plot i mean i know that since i've been told there is a plot no there isn't but it, there there wasn't i mean there kind of is but it's there's a jellico cat there, it's not like who gets to go to heaven is not a plot nope I mean, it is for rent also. Like, who's what? <laughs> Maybe this explains it. <laughs> Maybe that's a problem with my libretto. Maybe that's why that asshole was so pissed at it. Because it had, like, you know, depth and thickness to it. And it What's just, wrong? Like, oh, no. I actually had characters with feelings and, and, and a plot that actually had things happening. Versus we're not paying our rent. Yeah, no. Stop it. I'm sorry, the the 10 second version of it that like uh, was in South Park, Bigger, Longer, Uncut was about all you needed. Oh my God, I don't Not, even remember was that. It, was it that or was it in, no, maybe it was in the other one, the puppet movie. It was like, everyone has AIDS, do, 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 AIDS, 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 which is very tasteless and horrible. But like, you know what? It really was kind of in the spirit of the musical, I feel. I feel like you had to be a certain age at a certain time to have really liked that show. And I, I was neither of those things. And I was black. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord, Lord. So, yeah. So did the opera. Thought I was going to podcast all through it. Didn't. Finish the opera. And then I... <laughs> And this is the c catastrophic continuance. Like after we were done, Georg had to go back to New York immediately and start teaching. And he had gifted me a little vacation, a little slavecation. Yes. So that after the show, I could go and have a little time and hang out. And Rami and I were going to do like a little European road trip. Oh, nice. They were going to come out for a closing weekend and then close the show. And then we were going to jump in the car and go to Czech Republic and Slovenia and then Austria. But then they got cast in a show and couldn't come. And I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to do, I'm going to pare it back a little bit and make it less of a road trip and more of like me just chilling in various cool houses in, in Europe. Georg lost his green card or rather misplaced his green card last year. Oh, well. And applied for a new one. Okay. Did the thing. And then the plague hit. And the backlog for processing these things got longer and longer. So there's a website when you when you file for the replacement card, there's a whole immigration website and they tell you like what the what the wait time is currently for these um, sorts of procedures. And the wait time currently stands at 18 months. Shut up. There's an 18 month backlog for replacement or processing of green cards. And so what that means, and the thing is that he still has his status. It's just he doesn't have the physical card. So what that means is that someone needs to go and contact immigration. So when he checks in internationally, they need to contact immigration, blah, 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 blah. The thing is, if someone doesn't feel like doing that, they can just tell him, well, you don't have your green card. We're not letting you on the plane. And not because they care that you can't get into the country, but because if you can't get into the country, they have to fly you back. And so the reason that they denied him was because if in some small chance there was a fuck up, Delta would have to pay to fly him back to Austria to repatriate oh my goodness. him. And so the people working that morning would not let him leave. So I was packing up the apartment, trying to get ready to go. I get this frantic call from Georg from the airport. And he's like, what should I do? I can't. And the thing was, had I been there, I would have fought it through. Right. Like it, it, I would have been like, nope, supervisor, no, nope, super, your supervisor, your next supervisor, you need to get on the phone right now with fucking immigration in America and verify this motherfucker. Yes. You know, or give us something to sign that says it will fly back of our own accord. I'm a fucking platinum member. Do this right now. But that didn't happen. So he came back. And so everything I was doing derailed because he was unable to cope. And so, you know, the one thing that he did figure out, thank God, is that he remembered and thought about the fact that there are three places in the world where when you are flying from these places back to the U.S., you are processed through immigration on their soil. So in Canada in somewhere in the Middle East is another country and then also Ireland. Oh, so in Dublin, you pass through security and you pass through passport control in Ireland. And then when you get off the plane, you are in domestic. 
in the U.S. Okay. So I rebooked his flight through Ireland. Oh, my goodness. He flew goodness. through to Dublin. Yeah. And the problem with this is this. He was supposed to take with him three suitcases when he flew. And because everything was so up in the air and he was so fucked up, I said, you know what? Forget it. I'll just ship them. It's not cheap, but it's better than you freaking out. Right. And if something goes wrong, then you're in Dublin with three suitcases and, you know, whatever else. I said, I'll just take the suitcases with me on the road trip. I'll call one of these luggage shipping companies. I'll get the stuff. But what that meant was we had, I mean, I had acquired all the things I needed to make the house a home for three months. And so I had initially planned to give those things away to a friend who lived locally. And then his schedule, he was like, oh, I can't, I can't, whatever. So I was like, okay, I'll figure something out. So I threw all those things into the car. And the thing was that there was nowhere for me to even bring this stuff. I was going to say, there's probably not like a Goodwill? No, I mean... well, there is. But the thing is that those places, you have to fill out forms to donate your shit. Now, thankfully, what I did was I was like, now I know in Vienna... There are drop boxes. There are places that just accept stuff, like civilized countries, right? Yes. And so I said, okay, it's a drag, but I'll just bring the shit with me on my little road trip. And by the time I get to Vienna, I know I'll be able to donate the thing, the, the household goods. You know, the stuff that I was not allowed to leave behind at this place, even though she should have kept it. So get Georg back to America. I now have like five, six suitcases and all the household stuff at jammed, jammed into this SUV. Packed to the, like, literally having to lean on the door. Can't see out the backer sides. Fucking passenger seat piled up. That's great. Go on my little slavecation, which is now not a slavecation because now it's just a logistical nightmare. It is a logistical nightmare. And, and I don't think that people understand fully the amount of stuff that has to come the first few times i would meet you all places i would be like you have like 700 suitcases when you put look at the things that are in there you're like okay well i mean that makes sense one suitcase that makes... is the home office yes yep one suitcase is just the printer the paper the the books the scripts the Yes. The coffee machine. The, I mean, the, sorry, the espresso machine. So say it's the espresso machine. You know, right? like all of those things. And I am a maximalist because living away from home as much as we do. You have to be. I can't, you know. Well, you, especially when he works from home. Yeah. You work from home. So yeah. there's very specific things that you all need. Yep. But that's what I say. I don't think that people understand the the amount of stuff that has to come with you all for trips. So that five, six suitcases, plus the household stuff. That's... Please also keep in mind, we were there between August and October. Yeah. And so I needed light clothing. Yeah. And winter clothes. Yep. <laughs> okay. So it was, it was kind of epic. And as I say, I am a maximalist. I do have a suitcase just for my hats. Well, it I is mean, a smaller suitcase. They can't be crushed. But they can't be crushed. They're and amazing hats. I'm supposed to go with one hat? That's not a thing. That is not a fucking thing. So this trip became rife with just issues. So like the first place I get to, there's construction. I can't sleep. The second place I get to, you know, it takes me an hour to get in because the code was wrong or whatever. That was like perpetually like the third place I went to was this hotel in the middle of the busiest intersection oh in gosh. fucking Prague and there's nowhere to park. So I had to pull over on the, on a, in a bus stop to unload the, like the three suitcases that I could not leave in the car. Cause there were some things that were too precious to be left overnight in a fucking parking garage. Right? right. So I had to unload those three suitcases, bring them in, bring the car in, say a prayer over the rest of my shit, you know, which I actually, there was one point where I was like, if you steal it, actually, that would help me. <laughs> Take the spatulas. That would There's help a, me. a whole box of just that, that just stuff right help. here. So I did my slavecation and we sort of wrapped it up in Vienna. I, the, the last two, I got rid of all the household goods. I was down to just, you know, my suitcases. And I shipped off two suitcases and then went home, got back to New York with the other four suitcases that I had. Then I get a call from DHL. Yeah, your suitcase, we need you to fill out your customs form more accurately. The customs is turning it back because I just wrote down clothing. 
And they're like, you need to write a detailed list of the clothing and how much it's worth. Are you kidding me? And I was like, here's the thing. Like, I get it, but you, A, you can x-ray this and see that there's nothing hostile in there or bad. But it's not about hostility or badness. It's that they want to tax you. Oh. They want to tax you on your stuff, right? And so they have to know how much it's worth. And I'm like, here's the thing. Now you have my bags. You know for a fact I'm making this shit up. You know for a fact I'm making this up because I don't know. So, but I made something up and I sent it in and we went back and forth several times over the course of the next five days and they finally accepted it. And I'm like, great, ship it. Two weeks go by, nothing. And I find out that apparently there's a finite period that DHL will hold your stuff and then they give it back to you. What? Because I ha because the form, because it had taken them so long to approve my form, the form approval took longer than their hold time. So where was your stuff? They brought it back to the Airbnb that I had been staying in, <sighs> where I don't live, where no one lives. So they gave it to a neighbor in the building. Are you kidding me? So they me? left my luggage with a neighbor in the building. Are you kidding me? And I said, go back and get it. And they said, like DHL, literally, the DHL rep was like, do you have a contact number for the, they're in apartment 11, their name is, is is Heinz. I'm like, I, I live in New York City. That was an Airbnb I stayed in for a week. Do you see my home addresses in America? How are you even asking me this? So I contact the shipping company and I'm like, you need to talk to DHL. You need to get my shit. Week goes by. They're like, we're trying to this, this whatever. They're like, so then they start asking, do you have, I'm like, look, they keep saying to me, oh, it's with a neighbor. A neighbor has it. I'm like, I don't live, live there. there. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, I, so we're going back and forth and I'm like, here's the funny part. I have tile trackers in both of those suitcases. So I see them just sitting there in the building. There they are. And I'm like, go get them. DHL, just go get them. You know where they are. Knock on the door. Leave a call tag. Tell them to call me. To call, what? So, okay. So then we just say, look, in another month and a half, we're back in Vienna anyway. Right? Oh my gosh. So it has taken so long at this point that we're, we're back again. I said, we'll just find them. We'll go. We'll just, we'll knock on. They said it was this apartment. We'll go knock on the door. And if we don't find them, we'll leave a note and say, you have our shit. So we get to Vienna and our schedule on this trip is so fucking insane. We literally have no time in Vienna because we landed, like we landed on a Monday. Georg walked off the plane to the hotel, walked back out to rehearsals. Came back that night, that morning at 6 a.m. we had a flight to Berlin where we were there for two days because he had rehearsals and a performance. We flew back to Vienna where he had a series of rehearsals and then a show. Then I flew back to Berlin for a performance. I was performing with Cameron Moore, who is an amazing solo performance artist and storyteller. And we had put together a couple little shows and I was working on those. So I went, I worked with her for the first show the first night, had the second night off and the third night, Georg flew from Vienna back to Berlin, came to the show that night, that morning again, asked crack of dawn, we flew back to Vienna so that he'd go to rehearsal so that we could then go to the book launch for his memoir. Yes. Because the memoir just dropped. Confessions of a Nazi child. Not confessions. The life of a Nazi child, what is it? But the thing is that in German, Nazi child is Nazi Buben, which is just so <laughs> cute. Oh. Like a Nazi Buben. I've seen the cover with his poor little crying salute. Yeah. It's the saddest Possibly picture the most I think I've ever photo. seen. Of a Caucasian. Yeah, it's it's horrifically sad. <sighs> so so then that happened. And then then that night after that we had like a dinner, you know, sort of thing. And then the next day he had more rehearsals and whatever. So that day after that, keep in mind now, we have been sleeping for about five or six hours a night. We have had seven flights. Six flights within Europe for that week. I then get a phone call and I answer the phone and it's the guy from the Airbnb. And he says, hey, I have your suitcases. And I'm like, what? You have them. 
They told me the neighbor in room in, in apartment 11. He's like, yeah, I have them. So are you going to come get them? I'm like, yeah. When? when can I come today? He's like, I'm busy. <laughs> That's great. I said, OK, how about I'm looking at my schedule. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm like this day. He's like, no, I'm out of town. And I said, OK, Sunday. He goes, oh, Sunday, but I'm not free until after eight. And I'm like, OK, fine. So Sunday after eight, I call him. He messages back. Oh, I've been waiting for you all day. I'm having dinner with my girlfriend. It's too late. I can't do it now. But you said after eight. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And I was like, now this guy's a psycho. But the thing is, I'm like, he has my shit. So I go into, you know, you just go into that reptile thing. Yes. Where you're just like, okay, thank you so much. When may I pick them up? After midnight. Okay, great. You're going to call. Okay, thank After you. After midnight? Yeah, we have, we have a flight at like 9 a.m. It's perfect. Perfect timing, sir. So I'm like, you know what? But this is, I said, this is going to save us like over $600. We'll just have the stuff back. So I get literally to the point where we're like, everything is ready just to walk out the door in the morning, clean up the flat, get everything packed to the last second, like toothbrush and everything. You know what I mean? Like yes. the real ready to walk out the door packing. Yes. Call him at midnight. No answer. I call him 17 times in a row. No answer. Then he's like, oh, I'm on my way back now. I'll be there at about 1.30. Shut up. 1.30 in the morning? And I said, okay, thanks. And Gary, Gary tried to talk to me and I was like, I am incandescent, not now. Right. I was like, don't even hug me. I'll punch you. 2 a.m. Shut up. Nothing. So I texted him and I said, it's too late now. DHL will contact you. So the pickup arrangements are now to be made with them. We left. Oh. Did you ever get your bags? So I handed the phone number and the information to both DHL and mybaggage.com. A week goes by, two weeks. Oh no, a week, about a week, about a week. And then I got a, an, an email back and she said, we got in touch with him. He said he's out of town for a week. Of course he is. <laughs> And you would think he would want these Why two safes he... because gone. Like and here's the thing: it's not as though this is some treasure trove of shit that anybody wants, right? I want my Uggs back. Well, yes. I would like my beautiful bell-bottom jeans back. I would like my food shrinkity shrinkity wrapper thing back. I would like back my coveted lush king of skin body bars. Well, yes. The other dozen of them. I mean, I have a lot, but I have more. <laughs> And since they're discontinued, they are like gold to me. So that's, so yeah, my lug our luggage is still in Vienna. Right now, as yes. we speak? It is, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, that it's, hurts it's, my heart. It's so, bro, it's so crazy. It's so, so crazy. To, to give people context, it's what, December, what, 10th, 9th, something like that? 12th. It's been two months. Yeah. That shit has been there for two months. That's insane. Thoroughly. Thoroughly. So this is just, this is sort of just par for the course with how this year has gone. Over and over again, things that are not catastrophic, but enough to aggravate. Yeah, that's pretty aggravating. Enough to aggravate. Like, like so many things I tried to do just didn't really work out, you know? But then, like, you like know, I tried to take this online certification. I, I think I mentioned to you where I was, there's this really cool like company and a company, this school in Australia that does this certification for something that's called narrative therapy. Oh, and I was like, oh my God, yeah. this is what I, I was like. Yes. And then I signed up for the course and I paid for it. And I did the thing and everything else. And then I'm sitting there like in the first day of class. And over the course of the next three days, I realized I cannot do online learning. Really? I'm just sitting there and I'm like, I'm starting to glaze. I'm starting to catch. That's the first part. But the main part, the, the, that was the number two part, is that I realized that I just was having a hard time. But the okay. number one part was that the instructor had this vocal tick where he would talk like this. And after oh, half an hour of no, this, no, I was like, no, I can't. Nope. I actually need you to stop now. Yeah. It pains me to do it. Oh. And I was like, I tried to push through that. But my mesophonia was like, no, bitch. 
Yeah, no. I wanted to fight and die mm-hmm. at the same time. Mm-hmm. I actually need to contact them because I tried to get a refund and I never knew what happened because everything escaped me. Anyway, or they need to get a new instructor because that was ridiculous. I can't be the only person who finds that crazy making. Well, I co-sign because I just heard you do it and I wanted to not ever hear that again. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you were just like, I love her, so I'm not going to throw this mic at her head. But then again, (laughs) had you not stopped. (laughs) Just saying. Oh my God. So I would do like that girl did when she threw the rope around the dean blade. Oh God. The rope. Oh, the rope is not the weapon. Yes, it is, bitch. Yes. Oh my goodness. So yeah. So that's where we are. Here we are. Waiting for my luggage. Contemplating the beauty that is fucking the woman king. And- Celebrating the fact that your show was amazing. Thanks, dude. Like that is especially important coming from you since you are, you know, a theater person. Well, and I also have to say, I I am a person that really does not appreciate Shakespeare. I don't. I don't understand the stories. I've yet to figure out why I'm supposed to care. Mm. So I walked in going, okay, well, this is going to be about someone from Shakespeare. And while <laughs> I have seen The Tempest with Rami, and that was a beautiful production. Yeah. Here's what I remember about that. There was a really big set and amazing women of color all over that stage. I don't remember any of that story. So when, <laughs> when you were saying- I'm trying to remember the set. What was the set? It looked like a mountain. Remember it was a big mountain? It was a mountain. Oh my God. I, I'm i probably going to die of dementia in 30 seconds. 29. <laughs> It was a the big mountain. mountain. Set. Oof. Oh, you. And who knows? Maybe my memory of that is incorrect. But yeah, in my but head, I have no memory. Of it the was set. a big ass mountain. Jesus. And it was here, though, right? Philadelphia. Was it? it was a Philly one. That was a Philly one. Okay. All right. Now it's coming back a little bit. Okay. Yes. So you walk into this space, and it's just—it's not a traditional. Space. No, it's like a huge black box. It's a huge black box. It's through a warehouse. Like when we got there, I wasn't even sure that I was in the right place. Yeah. Because you come in, there's like some little food area. I was like, what's this? And then there's some artist studios. But there was a whole group of white people down at the end. So I was like, all right. It's got to be them. That's got to be it. So we go over there and getting into the space, you kind of go through this little tunnel that is like the tubes that are on the set. Yeah. And the set was so beautifully done it was so beautifully done i'll see if i can I'll, I'll i'll send cody some of the the photos of the set so we can put them on the show notes oh my gosh they were the, the set was gorgeous yeah the concept was sort of like a giant iron lung kind of the the, oh. the setup is that prospero has been sucking the air because the air on the island is magic air, right? Because there's oh. all these spirits and everything else. And so the idea is that like all these, you see all these tanks and bottles and yes. he's doing something with the air. It's not specified, but you're you're supposed to feel like something is happening. It felt very dystopian. Like the air is not good for some yes. reason. Like they're all wearing masks. They're all yes. fucked up. They don't look well. Yes. You know, there's something with the air going on. And so as the giant tentacle octopus that takes up the one quarter of the set starts to untangle the pipes yes you know that's part of what that's part of what sycorax does is her awakening from this tangle of of death essentially yes it starts to free the spirits and then you start to see them instead of just hear them you know and then ariel frees themselves as as it goes on and then and then miranda decides to stay you know she says you know what this is my home and this is where i belong and so, and then like the, the the pipes are all open and floating and it's supposed to be this like freedom has finally come. So here's what I saw. I saw a kick-ass set <laughs> that was amazing. And there was smoke everywhere. It was a lot of fucking smoke. There was a lot of smoke. You should have seen it. So it was, that was the backstage. only, it was the only time through the entire things that had smoke like right by the audience. And I was like, somebody's going to cough just to make a point. Somebody's gonna be no, that they're person. not. That shit is good because actually we did it when they when they first announced that they were going to be using smoke. I was like, asthmatic, asthmatic. We mm-hmm. need to do a test. 
because there's several different kinds of juice that they can use. And some of them are, or, some of them are more oily. Some of them are different. And I did not have a problem at all. No, not at all. Not and once. So they, they did use a very organic, you know, which this is, is one good. Of the good things about, about Europe is that they do give a shit about that. That is true. You know, they do care. Actually, about I don't know that shit. about them at all, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I will say the set was gorgeous. The set was just gorgeous. And then, so if you have not heard Georg's work, you don't ever really know what you're going to hear. Like I didn't know going in, what is it that's going to, what, what am I going to hear? What, what will this experience? Cause I've seen several of his things at this point yeah. in my life. And I'm always like, okay. Yeah, he does have a broad breadth. Of... He has a broad breadth. And then with the opera yeah. portion of it and the story, and then the the choir came on, I think one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard in my life. Mm -hmm. How they were able to, I don't even know what they did with their voices and the harmonies and the the synchronicity. Everything was just so spot on and yeah. perfect first of all they're just a brilliant choir oh my gosh they they this is the thing is that they have they're in-house and so that's they, the in-house choir yeah are you kidding no, me no i shit you not that's their choir and so they work together they're co-workers right y'all they, they were together amazing. all the time and so they know each other and they know their voices and they are just game and willing to jump in and do this crazy shit, right? Like there was one point where we they decided that they wanted to have some people in the tubes so that they moved in a different way than the ones that were just floating. And like 10 people raised their hand. They're like, we'll jump in the tubes. Like they were just so fun and so wonderful. And and it was it was amazing. It was just how they sounded. There was one point the first time we rehearsed with them, I it was beyond goosebumps. Like you, you, like you say the thing like your skin crawls. And it feels like a bad thing, but this was skin crawling in a good, good way. way because there's a point where the fairy, she approaches me and she's singing, you know, and she's got this amazing voice. And then the chorus comes in under her. Yes. And yes. the first time I heard it, I said, is she miked? They mirrored her so perfectly. It sounded like they had an echo mic on her. Insanity, right? I, I cannot say enough words about how phenomenal that chorus was. They are the shit. And then every person, so the direction was spot on. And, and what I loved about this play is that I was learning things as a theater professional, as a director. I was able to say, say to myself, oh, that's not a choice I would have made. I can see why they made that choice. And that's some brilliant it's brilliant and you of course were brilliant from the moment that you walked on that stage Yay. and i wasn't sure how the singing and the talking would work but it flowed together so nicely and harriet's libretto made sense they had the fucking words up there so if i couldn't understand the words there were subtitles <laughs> like that was the only thing that i didn't like about that show was that that old ass lady that was sitting to the right of me where she <laughs> had this fucking face on and i was like lady if this show wasn't going i would go over and fix your face but i think that that was just her she just had that face. She just had that face. She just had that face. Some people just have that face. They can't help it. But it was, I will tell you, I was very surprised because one of the things that I was worried about was an old white opera audience. Yes. And I was like, is this just going to be painful? Because the final scene of the show, I addressed the audience directly. And the thought of going through like over an hour of this performance and then stepping into breaking the fourth wall and then looking at like bored or angry white old white people i was like this is just going to be a buzzkill not a fucking thing at all no i mean the not audience a fucking thing at the all. audience there that night i mean people were were dressed in character dressed as prospero <laughs> well, you were there for opening, so it was an extra zesty. Oh, night. they were super zesty, <laughs> minus the lady with the purse in the face. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so it was so striking to me to see people moved to tears, to see people literally leaning forward in oh, their yeah. seat. You know, there was we, there were zero we, zero weak points in that show. It was so. I'm just I'm, I'm so proud of it. 
And I feel like I told Georg, I said, I feel like karmically every issue or problem or pitfall or, you know, three days worth of processing or whatever the fuck that we did, all of that sort of sucked away any bad karma from that show. Mm -hmm. Like for the first time in my life, in my life, I was ready for an audience during tech. Nice. I have never had that happen. Nice. The artistic director of the opera house came to, they, they invited audience for, we had three dress rehearsals with audience, right? The first one was for donors. And I was like, Jesus Christ. And he said to me afterwards, he said, usually when we have these performances, Afterwards, we sit and we have a discussion as to whether or not we can even open the show on time. Oh, yes. You know this. I mean, I've, I, have, I have had those tech you weeks myself. You know this. Yes. You know this. And with opera, like you need to understand, it's regular theater and musical theater and plus opera singers. Yeah. No. Right? It's a lot. And so the fact, and the tech was insane. There were four fucking smoke machines full that turntable up there they built it for the show of course there was they a did. 30 foot wide turntable that turned and moved those tubes yes they did all I, that had to be tech the the what we are talking about cannot be described aptly because even when you were posting facebook posts about it and you had like the one where you were in one of the tubes. I was like, oh, okay, there'll be tubes on stage. It's not until you see the full thing where you're like, oh, oh. <laughs> no, there are tubes. No, no, this is like, and then they moved up the audience. Like it was, it was phenomenal. And it was well-crafted. The singing across the board, the, the principles were, it was stupid how good everything was. Yeah. And I feel like I was just like, I feel like I, I moved into a different realm for myself as a performer. Right. You know, like, I feel like, okay, I'm an actor, you know, I'm not. I think that that character had to be so grounded yeah. that you had to embody that, that space. And that feels differently, especially when you do have that own grounding within yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like it's, it's, she literally saves the world. Yes. <laughs> but like without fanfare. Like black women do. <laughs> Touche. Yes. <laughs> We've been talking forever, so I should probably wrap this up. We should probably wrap this up. Dana Dane. With fame. <laughs> Amen. Do you have anything you want to plug? Do you want to donate money to an yeah. amazing rape crisis center? Yes. What is the name of the rape crisis center, please? Literally the rape crisis center. Okay. Well, we are hitting our 50th year oh my in God. 2023. We're actually the second oldest rape crisis center in the nation. Are you kidding? I am not. What is the website? T-H-E-R-C-C dot O-R-G. The rape crisis center. Dot org. org. Yeah. But it's just a T H E R C. It's just a, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you don't want to spell all that out. Sure don't. My God. Yeah. You just, you need to know that despite the fact that apparently in a past life she was Pol Pot, Data is one of the most magnificent champions of awesomeness that I've ever met. I don't know how she does what she does. I don't know how she's even sitting. I don't know how she's sitting here talking to me over the weekend because she's getting on a plane in three hours or some shit to fly back and have a full fucking day of work on Monday. Cause she's crazy and amazing. And if you are someone who does donate money to worthy causes, please consider dropping a couple of bucks towards the rape crisis center. The second oldest one in the nation in Madison, Wisconsin. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So thank you so much. Thank you. For thank you for re and not for breaking my re breaking my cherry by my, my, not cherry. I guess it's like my, my w spider web cherry. <laughs> I combed through the webs <laughs> to get to the cast. And if you dug this and you would like to hear some more, I have a bunch of episodes you can scroll back through and listen to those. I will um, probably be back soon. I don't know. Here's the thing I finally realized. I 
need to take care of myself first. And Dana was gr- good about pointing out, reminding me that if I do this podcast, it's fine. And if I don't, it's still fine. Correct. I attach so much to like perfection and not, and if I don't do something right, when there's not even a right. There sure isn't. Son of a bitch. Anyway, um, blah, 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 Patreon, blah, 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 things with the stuff. And if you are a Patreon person, then as of now, I don't think I have, I'm not sure if I have been posting, I have to check with my producer if we've been posting the secret ancient episodes, because there's a secret ancient episodes that the patrons get to listen to of my previous stab at doing a podcast. So yeah, those are available to other folks. And I appreciate you listening so very much. Thank you. Take good care. And if you can't take good care of yourself, let someone else take care of you. Or not. You've been listening to All That and Mo. Thanks so much for spending your precious, precious time with me today. My podcast is produced by Cody Crabb, theme music by Georg Friedrich Haas, as performed by Marcus Weiss. And I look forward to spending time with you again really soon. <laughs>